married men. What secret did you learn about your wife only after you got married? Story one. You know, there are some things you discover about your partner only after you've been together for a while. Those little quirks and habits that don't reveal themselves until you've spent enough time around each other. For me, one of those things was my wife sneezing. I'll never forget the first time I heard it. We'd only been dating for a few months, and we were hanging out at my place just enjoying a quiet evening. Suddenly, out of nowhere, she let out this sneeze that sounded more like a scream. I swear, it nearly scared the life out of me. It wasn't just any sneeze. It was a full-on, top-of-the-lungs, blow-your-hair-back kind of sneeze. The kind that makes you jump out of your skin and wonder if there's been some kind of explosion nearby. I looked at her, wide-eyed and startled, and she just laughed it off like it was the most normal thing in the world. Sorry, she said, smiling. I sneezed loud. Loud didn't even begin to cover it. It was like she was trying to scare the cow out of me, or maybe out of the entire neighborhood. The sheer volume of it was something I wasn't prepared for, and honestly, I'm still not used to it, even after 10 years of marriage. You'd think after a decade, I'd be able to anticipate it. Maybe brace myself whenever I see that telltale look on her face, the one that says a sneeze is coming. But no matter how many times it happens, it still catches me off guard. It's like living with a surprise air horn that goes off at random intervals. One moment, everything's calm and peaceful. And the next, she's unleashing this ear-splitting sneeze that could probably be heard three houses down. Our poor daughter, who's still young and easily startled, is especially affected by it. Every time her mom lets out one of those sneezes, our little girl jumps and covers her ears, then looks up at her mom with wide, concerned eyes. Mommy, you're too loud, she says, her voice tinged with both awe and a bit of fear. It's become a running joke in our family, this ongoing battle between my wife's sneezes and the rest of us trying to keep our sanity intact. The funny thing is, she can actually hold it back in public. It's like she has a switch that she flips when we're out around other people. Instead of the full-blown scream sneeze, she'll manage to keep it subdued, almost dainty, like any other sneeze you'd hear on the street. It's baffling to me how she can pull that off because at home it's a whole different story. I've asked her about it, how she manages to sneeze quietly in public but lets it all out when we're at home. She just shrugs and says something about how it's more comfortable to sneeze naturally when she's not worried about disturbing anyone. But honestly, I think it's one of those quirks that makes her who she is. Sure, it can be jarring. And yes, I'll probably never fully get used to it. But it's also something we laugh about. A shared experience that's become a part of our lives together. It's one of those things that's uniquely her. A trait that, for better or worse, makes her stand out in the best possible way. I'll admit, there are moments when I've seriously considered investing in some earplugs. Especially on days when her allergies are acting up and the sneezes come in rapid succession. But then I think about all the other things that come with it. The laughter, the way our daughter reacts, the inside jokes that have grown out of this one little habit. It's part of our family dynamic now, and in a weird way, I wouldn't change it for the world. So here we are, 10 years in, and I'm still jumping out of my skin every time she sneezes. But that's okay. It's just one of those things you learn to live with, one of those quirks that adds color to your life together. And honestly, in a world where everything can feel so predictable, it's nice to have a little bit of chaos, even if it comes in the form of a sneeze that could wake the dead. Story 2. When my wife and I were dating, I knew she had a fondness for Christmas. Who doesn't love a little holiday cheer, right? We even lived together before getting married, and during that time, her enthusiasm for the season seemed perfectly manageable. She'd put up a few decorations, maybe bake some cookies, and we'd watch a Christmas movie or two. It was cozy, festive, but nothing over the top. I thought I had a pretty good handle on what Christmas with her would be like. But then we got married. And let me tell you, the moment we said I do, it was like a switch flipped. Suddenly, I found myself married to someone who didn't just enjoy Christmas. She lived and breathed it. And she started celebrating early. I'm talking way early. Like, as soon as the calendar hits October, she's already in full holiday mode. It all started innocently enough. One year, just after our first wedding anniversary, I came home from work on the first day of October to find our living room transformed. There was a tree in the corner, not just a tree, but a full-blown, decked-out Christmas tree complete with garland, twinkling lights, and more ornaments than I could count. The scent of cinnamon and pine filled the air, and I swear I could hear the faint strains of jingle bells playing in the background. Uh, honey, I said, trying to keep the surprise out of my voice. It's October. Halloween's still weeks away. She looked up from where she was carefully placing yet another snowman figurine on the mantel, smiled, and said, Oh, I know. But we're married now, so you have to like this too. She was joking, of course. Or at least, I thought she was. But there was a twinkle in her eye that told me this was just the beginning. And it was. From that year on, October became the official start of Christmas in our house. 
By the time the trick-or-treaters came around, our home was already a winter wonderland. Every room was filled with decorations, wreaths, garlands, stockings, you name it. Michael Buble's Christmas album became the soundtrack of our lives for the next three months, playing on a loop until I could practically sing every word in my sleep. I quickly realized that my wife's love for Christmas wasn't just a holiday tradition. It was an obsession. She threw herself into it with a kind of passion and energy that was both impressive and, if I'm being honest, a little overwhelming. We had boxes upon boxes of decorations, each one carefully labeled and organized. She had a detailed schedule for when each decoration would go up, and she even had a list of new items she wanted to add to the collection each year. And it wasn't just about the decorations. She had a whole routine. There were holiday-themed baking sessions, Christmas movie marathons, and trips to the local Christmas markets to pick out even more ornaments and gifts. We'd host elaborate holiday parties, complete with themed cocktails and a playlist that was 100% holiday tunes. She even convinced me to dress up as Santa one year for our nieces and nephews. At first, I tried to resist. I mean, who needs Christmas to last three whole months? But it didn't take long for me to realize that this was a battle I wasn't going to win. And honestly, once I stopped fighting it, I started to see the charm in it all. Sure, it was intense, but it was also a lot of fun. There was something magical about coming home to a house that looked like it had been pulled straight out of a Christmas movie. It was impossible not to get caught up in her excitement. Over time, I even started to look forward to it. There's something about the way she lights up during the holiday season that's contagious. Her joy is infectious, and seeing how happy it makes her makes me happy too. Now I find myself getting into the spirit right alongside her. Maybe not quite as early as October, but certainly by the time November rolls around. We've been married for years now, and every October, without fail, our home transforms into a Christmas wonderland. I've come to accept that this is just part of life with her, and honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. It's become a part of our story, this shared love for a holiday that stretches out for months on end. And while I may never fully understand her need to start celebrating Christmas before Halloween, I can appreciate the joy it brings to her and to us. Story 3. I'm happily divorced now, coming up on 12 years if my math's right. It's funny how time flies and how certain lessons stick with you long after the fact. When I look back on my marriage, there's one thing that stands out as a major turning point. Something that I didn't see coming but probably should have. It's a classic tale of how different people can have very different ideas about money and how those differences can make or break a relationship. Before we got married, we were in a typical situation where money was tight. I wasn't exactly rolling in cash, but whatever I had, I considered ours. We were a team, and I was more than happy to share what little I had to help us both get by. She wasn't making much or anything really at the time, but it didn't matter to me. We were in it together, and that's what counted. It was all about building a future together, or at least that's what I thought. But then, after we got married, things changed, quickly and drastically. Not long after the wedding, she landed a well-paying job. I was thrilled for her. I thought this was a great step forward for both of us, that we'd finally have a little more breathing room financially and could start planning for the future with less stress. But that's when the first crack started to show. Suddenly, there was a shift in how she viewed our finances. Her money, she decided, was hers. Not ours, but hers. My money, on the other hand? That was still very much ours, according to her. It was a subtle change at first, but it didn't take long for it to become glaringly obvious. She'd make comments about her paychecks, about how she was saving up for this or that. But those conversations never included me. If I brought up any shared expenses or plans for something we might want to do together, the response was usually something along the lines of, well, you can cover that, right? It was a strange and frustrating shift. Before we got married, I had been more than willing to share everything I had. Even when she didn't have much to contribute financially, I never once thought of it as a burden or something to hold against her. We were partners, and that's what partners do. They share, they support each other. But now, the dynamic had completely flipped, and I was left wondering where that sense of partnership had gone. The more I tried to talk to her about it, the more she dug in her heels. It became clear that in her mind, the money she earned was her own to do with as she pleased. There was no longer a sense of us in the financial aspect of our marriage. It was every person for themselves. I tried to rationalize it, to understand her point of view, but it just didn't sit right with me. It wasn't what I had signed up for when we got married. I believed in the idea that marriage meant sharing everything. Not just the good times, but the responsibilities too, including financial ones. It didn't take long for that issue to start seeping into other areas of our relationship. We began to argue more frequently, not just about money, but about everything. It was as if that shift in how she viewed our finances was symptomatic of a larger problem. A fundamental difference in how we saw our marriage and what we wanted out of it. The trust that had been the foundation of our relationship began to erode. 
replaced by a growing sense of resentment and frustration. I started to feel like I was being taken advantage of, that the person I thought I knew had revealed a side of herself that I hadn't seen before. It wasn't just about the money, it was about the principle. Marriage, to me, was supposed to be about partnership, about facing life's challenges together. But now it felt like I was going it alone, even though we were supposed to be in this together. In the end, it became clear that we were on completely different pages. The idea that my money was still ours, while her money was only hers, was a deal breaker. It wasn't something I could reconcile with the values I held about marriage and partnership. The resentment grew too strong, and eventually it became impossible to ignore. So we parted ways. The marriage didn't last much longer after that realization hit me. Looking back now, I can see that it was probably for the best. We just weren't as compatible as I'd thought. It's funny how money, or rather the way you think about money, can reveal so much about a person and a relationship. It can bring out sides of people that you never knew were there. Story 4 It was the second night of our honeymoon, and everything was going great. We had decided to take it easy that evening, staying in our cozy hotel room with some takeout and just enjoying each other's company. It was the perfect way to unwind after the whirlwind of the wedding and the travel that had followed. My beverage of choice at the time was crystal light raspberry ice, something I'd been drinking for years without a second thought. It was light, refreshing, and I always had a few packets handy. We were settled in, laughing and chatting over our food when my wife, without thinking, reached over and asked for a sip of my drink. I didn't think twice about it. After all, what could be the harm in sharing a sip of my drink with my new wife? So I handed it over and she took a big gulp. Not even five minutes later, she started to look pale. Then her breathing became labored and she doubled over in pain. I was immediately on high alert, my mind to figure out what was happening. Was it something in the food? Maybe a reaction to the hotel room? She was visibly struggling and I was starting to panic. Amid the chaos, she suddenly grabbed the bottle of crystal light and read the label. That's when she looked up at me with wide eyes and yelled, I am allergic to aspartame. Now you have to understand, I'm a pretty laid-back guy, but in that moment, all I could do was stare at her in shock. Allergic? Aspartame? I had no idea she was allergic to anything, let alone the stuff that was in my go-to drink. So, being the loving, concerned, and utterly confused new husband that I was, I yelled right back, Since when? You never told me that! It was one of those moments where the surprise was so overwhelming that you can't help but react with equal intensity. Here we were, not even two full days into our married life, and I was just finding out that my wife had this serious allergy. My mind was trying to figure out how I could have missed something so important. But then, as we both calmed down, she explained that it hadn't really come up before because she had grown up in a household where artificial sweeteners were completely avoided. She never had to worry about it, so it just didn't occur to her to tell me. Looking back, I get why she never mentioned it. If you've spent your whole life avoiding something without even thinking about it, it's easy to forget that others might not be aware of your needs. But in that moment, it felt like a big deal, like something I should have known as her husband. I felt a bit guilty, like I'd failed some sort of husband test by not knowing about her allergy beforehand. As the night wore on and the initial shock subsided, we managed to find some humor in the situation. We were both new to this whole marriage thing, and clearly, there were still things we had to learn about each other. I mean, who could have guessed that a simple drink would turn into such a dramatic start to our honeymoon? Since that night, we've made it a point to talk more openly about any quirks or preferences we might have overlooked before. And believe me, I've made sure to steer clear of anything with aspartame when she's around. The experience taught us an important lesson about communication, about not assuming that the other person knows everything, even if you've been together for years before getting married. In the end, that night became one of those stories we tell with a laugh. It's a reminder of how we're still figuring things out as we go along, even after all this time. Now we both make sure to check labels and ingredients whenever we're trying something new just to be safe. And whenever I see a bottle of crystal light raspberry ice, I can't help but smile, thinking about how our honeymoon took an unexpected turn that brought us even closer. Story 5. When my wife and I first moved in together, I quickly noticed something that wasn't exactly a deal breaker, but definitely something I hadn't expected. She's the kind of person who's laid back and easygoing, the type who doesn't stress too much about the small stuff. It's one of the things I love about her. She brings a sense of calm and balance to my life, especially when I start getting too wrapped up in the day-to-day -day grind. But there's one thing I didn't see coming. Unless I specifically ask her to do something around the house, she won't do it. It's not that she refuses or gets upset if I ask her to help out with the chores. In fact, she's perfectly fine with pitching in when I bring something up. It's just that it never seems to cross her mind on her own. At first, I wasn't sure how to feel about it. I grew up in a household where everyone just naturally pitched in. If the dishes needed doing, someone did them. If the floor needed sweeping, it got swept. 
there was this unspoken understanding that everyone took care of things as they came up. So when I started noticing that my wife wasn't naturally jumping in to do the dishes or tidy up, I couldn't help but wonder if I was missing something. I'd come home from work and see the sink full of dishes, the laundry basket overflowing, and the dust starting to settle on the shelves. My initial reaction was confusion. Why wasn't she noticing these things and taking care of them? But then I realized something important. It wasn't that she was ignoring the chores or avoiding them. She genuinely didn't think about it unless it was pointed out. It's just how her mind works. She's not one to stress about whether the house is spotless, and she doesn't seem to notice the little things that might be bothering me. It's not a matter of laziness or stubbornness. It's simply that her priorities are different. She's more focused on big picture stuff, like planning our next vacation or thinking about what we're going to do over the weekend, rather than whether the sink is empty or the floors are mopped. When I first brought it up, I wasn't sure how she'd react. I was half expecting her to get defensive or annoyed, but instead she just shrugged and said, Oh, I didn't realize it bothered you. Just ask me next time and I'll take care of it. There was no argument, no tension, just a simple acknowledgement and a willingness to help out when needed. It's not that she doesn't care about the house being clean. When I ask her to do something specific like vacuuming or putting away the dishes, she does it without hesitation. And on the rare occasions when she does notice something that needs doing, she'll jump in and handle it. But for the most part, if I don't bring it up, it's just not on her radar. Over time, I've learned to accept this as one of the quirks of our relationship. It's not about who's right or wrong. It's about understanding each other's perspectives and finding a way to make it work. So now, instead of silently getting frustrated when the chores pile up, I just ask, Hey, can you take care of the dishes tonight? Or, do you mind vacuuming the living room? And she's happy to do it. We've settled into a rhythm that works for us. I've learned to let go of the expectation that she'll automatically notice the things that need to be done. And she's learned to be more mindful of helping out when I ask. It's a compromise. Like so many things in marriage, and it's made our life together smoother and more harmonious. And honestly, her laid-back approach has rubbed off on me a bit too. I've realized that not everything needs to be done right away, and that it's okay to let some things slide until we can tackle them together. In a way, she's helped me chill out about the small stuff and focus on the bigger picture, which is spending quality time together and enjoying our life. Sure, there are still moments when I wish she'd notice the pile of laundry before I do, but I've come to appreciate that our differences in how we approach things are what make us work as a couple. She brings a sense of ease to our home and I bring a bit of structure. Together, we balance each other out. Story six. When my wife and I first got married, I quickly discovered that sleeping next to a sleep apnea machine wasn't exactly the peaceful, quiet experience I'd imagined. I had known she had sleep apnea before we tied the knot, but nothing really prepares you for the reality of sharing a bed with a CPAP machine, the original kind, back when they were about as subtle as a lawnmower in your bedroom. That first night, I remember lying there, trying to get used to the steady hum of the machine. I tried to be understanding. I knew it was necessary for her health. And of course, I wanted her to sleep soundly and safely. But man, that thing was loud. It was like having a truck engine idling right next to you all night long. The noise was relentless, a constant reminder that sleep wasn't going to come easily for me. At least not at first. I tried everything to get used to it. Earplugs were my first line of defense. But even those couldn't completely block out the sound. I considered moving to the couch, but I didn't want to be apart from her, especially not during those early days of marriage when everything else was so new and exciting. So I stuck it out, hoping that with time, I'd learn to tune it out. The funny thing is, over time, I did. The human mind is pretty amazing at adapting to new circumstances, and eventually, that CPAP machine became just another part of our nightly routine. The noise faded into the background, and I found ways to sleep through it. We joked about it, too, how I was getting used to falling asleep with the soundtrack of CP app, the musical, playing in the background every night. It became one of those quirks in our relationship, something we laughed about together. But then, about 10 years into our marriage, we decided it was time for an upgrade. The original CPAP machine had done its job, but technology had come a long way. And there were quieter, more efficient models on the market. So we made the switch to a newer model, a ResMed 10 Cloud. And let me tell you, it was like night and day. The first night with the new machine, I almost couldn't believe it. I kept waiting for the familiar rumble to start up, but instead there was nothing. Just a gentle, almost imperceptible whir, so quiet that I had to strain to hear it. I turned to my wife and said, is it even on? She laughed and assured me that yes, it was on. And yes, she could breathe just fine. The difference was incredible. Suddenly, our bedroom was quiet again, and I could fall asleep without the earplugs 
without the constant hum in the background. It was like a whole new world of sleep had opened up for me, and I could finally understand what it was like to sleep in complete peace next to my wife. Of course, by that point, I was so used to the old machine that the quiet almost felt strange at first. But I quickly adjusted, and now I can't imagine going back to the way things were. The ResMed 10 Cloud is so quiet that sometimes I have to check to make sure it's actually running. It's made a world of difference for both of us. She gets the restful sleep she needs, and I get to enjoy a peaceful night's rest without feeling like I'm sleeping next to a diesel engine. Looking back, it's amazing how something as simple as upgrading a piece of medical equipment can make such a big difference in your daily life. It's not just about the sleep, though that's a huge part of it. It's about the little things that add up over time. The things you don't realize are affecting you until they're gone. That old CPAP machine was a part of our lives for so long, but I'm glad we made the switch. Now, when we go to bed at night, I don't even think about the machine. It's just there, quietly doing its job, allowing both of us to get the rest we need. And for that, I'm grateful. It's one of those small improvements that has had a big impact on our quality of life, and it's something we don't take for granted. Story 7. My husband and I had been together for three years before we finally tied the knot. During that time, we did all the usual things couples do. Going out for dinner, catching movies, and indulging in sweet treats together. One of our favorite little traditions was grabbing ice cream, especially on warm summer evenings. I've always had a bit of a sweet tooth, and ice cream in particular is my weakness. There's something about sharing a cone or a sundae that just feels special. Like a little moment of happiness that we could enjoy together. We'd hit up all the local spots, trying different flavors, comparing our favorites, and generally making it a regular part of our dates. I loved those moments. They were simple but sweet, literally and figuratively. I always thought it was something we both enjoyed equally. Two people blissfully savoring every scoop lost in our own little world. Then we got married, and over a year into our marriage, he let something slip that completely blindsided me. We were sitting at home one evening, talking about random things, when he casually mentioned that he was lactose intolerant. I did a double take, not quite sure I'd heard him right. Wait, I said, staring at him in disbelief. You're lactose intolerant? He looked at me with a sheepish grin, and that's when it all came out. Apparently, he'd been lactose intolerant for as long as he could remember. All those times we'd gone out for ice cream, all those sundaes and milkshakes we'd shared, he'd been silently enduring the consequences, all because he didn't want to ruin my fun. He knew how much I loved ice cream, and he didn't want to take that joy away from me. So instead of telling me, he just went along with it every single time. I was floored. Why didn't you tell me? I asked feeling a mix of shock, guilt, and admiration all at once. He shrugged, his grin turning into a soft smile. I didn't want you to feel bad about enjoying something you love. I figured it was worth it, just to see you happy. That hit me right in the heart. I couldn't believe he'd been doing that for me, all those times, without saying a word. Here I was, thinking we were both having the time of our lives, indulging in this little treat together. And meanwhile, he was quietly suffering in the background, just to make sure I was happy. It was one of those moments where you realize just how much someone loves you, how they're willing to put your happiness above their own comfort, even in the smallest of ways. Of course, after that revelation, I felt terrible. I kept thinking back to all those nights we'd spent together and how he must have felt afterward. I couldn't believe I hadn't noticed, but then again, he'd done a great job of hiding it. He never complained, never hinted that anything was wrong. He'd just smile, take another bite, and let me enjoy the moment. I hugged him and told him that he didn't have to do that anymore that we could find other things to enjoy together that wouldn't make him sick. But he just laughed and said it wasn't a big deal, that he'd do it all over again if it meant seeing me smile. That's just the kind of person he is, selfless to a fault, always thinking about others before himself. Since then, we've had to make a few adjustments. We don't go out for ice cream nearly as often, and when we do, we make sure there's a lactose-free option available. I've also started experimenting with lactose-free ice cream at home, trying to recreate some of our favorite flavors without the discomfort. It's become a new kind of fun for us, exploring different ways to enjoy the things we love while making sure we're both comfortable. But more than anything, that moment taught me something important about our marriage. It's not just about the big gestures or the grand romantic moments. It's about the little sacrifices, the quiet acts of love that often go unnoticed. It's about being willing to endure a little discomfort just to make the other person happy, even if they never know about it. Story 8 it wasn't my story, but it's one that has shaped my life in more ways than I can count. This one's about my parents and the roller coaster they found themselves on right after they got married. My mom always said that marrying my dad felt like the start of a beautiful adventure. They were young, in love, and ready to take on the world together. 
But what she didn't realize was that this adventure came with some pretty harsh surprises, ones that hit her like a ton of bricks just a week after the wedding. The first shock came when she found out that my dad was deep in debt. We're not talking about a few missed payments or a small loan. This was heavy, serious debt that my mom had no idea about. She'd gone into the marriage thinking they were starting fresh, building a life together, only to find out that they were already weighed down by a financial burden she hadn't anticipated. My dad had kept it hidden, and it wasn't until after they were married that he finally came clean, likely because he couldn't hide it any longer. My mom was blindsided. She felt betrayed, confused, and worried about what this meant for their future. It wasn't just the debt itself that was the problem. It was the fact that he hadn't told her, hadn't trusted her enough to be honest before they got married. It was a breach of trust that would take years to heal, if it ever did. But that wasn't the only surprise in store for her. As they settled into married life, it quickly became clear that my dad wasn't ready to leave his bachelor lifestyle behind. Despite being a husband, and soon after, a father, he wasn't interested in the stable, family-oriented life that my mom had envisioned. He still wanted to go out with his friends, stay out late, and live like he had no responsibilities. The idea of settling down, of prioritizing his family, seemed to be the furthest thing from his mind. My mom had hoped that marriage and starting a family would mean building a life together, one based on mutual respect, love, and shared goals. But instead, she found herself married to someone who wasn't ready or willing to make that commitment. It wasn't that he didn't care about her or their child. It was more like he didn't know how to reconcile the life he had with the life he was now supposed to lead. He was torn between two worlds, and unfortunately, the pull of his old life was too strong. This realization hit my mom hard. She had to come to terms with the fact that the man she married wasn't who she thought he was, at least not in the ways that mattered most to her. She was left holding the pieces of a life that wasn't what she'd dreamed of, trying to figure out how to move forward in a marriage where she felt like she was doing it all alone. She was raising a child, managing a household, and now trying to dig them out of debt, all while my dad seemed more interested in hanging on to his freedom than building a stable home. It wasn't the happy, loving partnership she had imagined. Instead, it was a constant struggle, a series of disappointments that chipped away at her hope and optimism. She loved my dad, but love alone wasn't enough to make up for the broken promises and unmet expectations. The weight of it all, the debt, the loneliness, the sense of betrayal, started to take its toll on her. And while she tried her best to hold things together, the cracks were there, growing deeper with each passing day. My mom stuck it out for as long as she could, hoping that things would change, that my dad would finally step up and embrace the life they were supposed to be building together. But deep down, she knew that the man she'd married wasn't going to change, at least not in the ways she needed him to. It wasn't until much later that she would finally make the decision to put herself and her child first, but by then, the damage had been done. Looking back, it's clear that my mom's story is one of resilience and strength, even in the face of overwhelming challenges. She didn't get the fairy tale ending she deserved, but she found a way to keep going, to take care of herself and her child, even when it felt like the world was against her. My dad's choices shaped the course of their marriage, but my mom's determination and courage shaped the course of her life. In the end, their marriage didn't survive, but my mom did. She emerged from it all with a clear understanding of what she needed and deserved in life, and she never lost sight of that again. It wasn't an easy journey, but it was one that taught her, and by extension, me, about the importance of honesty, trust, and the willingness to face reality, even when it's painful. Story 9. This isn't my story, but it's one that deeply affected my family. Something my mom went through that I only found out about much later. It's one of those things that changes the way you see your parents. Not necessarily in a bad way, but in a way that makes you realize they're human, with struggles and battles you might never fully understand. My mom discovered, after they'd been married for some time, that my dad had a serious addiction. He was caught up in something that was not only harmful to him, but to their relationship as well. It wasn't just a passing issue or something that could be easily brushed aside. It was something that shook the foundation of their marriage. My dad was addicted to explicit content, the kind of stuff that can really mess with a person's mind, and more importantly, the trust between partners. I only know about this because my mom mentioned it once, almost in passing, when I was old enough to understand, but still young enough that it felt like a shock. She didn't go into detail, and she didn't need to. I could tell by the way she spoke about it that it had been a huge challenge for both of them. There was pain in her voice, a weariness that came from years of dealing with something that had almost broken them apart. From what I gathered, it wasn't just the addiction itself that was hard to deal with. It was the betrayal of trust, the feeling that the person you loved and trusted had been hiding something so significant from you. My mom had to come to terms with the fact that the man she married had this hidden struggle, something she never imagined she'd have to face. 
It wasn't the kind of problem you can just talk about over dinner and solve with a simple conversation. It required deep, painful discussions, a lot of hard work, and more than a little bit of soul-searching. She hinted that deciding to stay was one of the hardest choices she'd ever made. I could see why. It's one thing to find out your partner has a problem. It's another to decide that you're going to stick with them and work through it together, even when every instinct might be telling you to run the other way. My mom is one of the strongest people I know, but this tested her in ways that I can only begin to imagine. They had to rebuild their relationship from the ground up. Trust had to be earned back, and that's not something that happens overnight. My dad had to confront his demons, and my mom had to decide if she could ever really forgive him. It was a long, difficult process, and though she didn't talk about it much, I could tell it left a mark on her. It's one of those things that stays with you, even after the worst is over. The fact that they're still together today is a testament to how hard they worked to overcome this. They didn't just sweep it under the rug or pretend it didn't happen. They faced it head on, dealt with the pain, and somehow found a way to move forward. My dad had to commit to changing, to getting help, and to being honest about his struggles. My mom had to find it within herself to forgive, to rebuild the trust that had been shattered, and to open her heart again, even when it must have felt impossible. I think about that a lot, especially now that I'm older and have my own relationships to navigate. What my parents went through is a reminder that marriage isn't always easy or straightforward. There are things that can come up that you never expect, things that can test your love and your commitment in ways you couldn't have imagined on your wedding day. It's not always the romantic fairy tale picture we're often sold. It's real and it's messy and sometimes it's incredibly painful, but it's also powerful. Seeing my parents work through this, seeing them come out the other side still together, taught me about the strength of love, the power of forgiveness, and the importance of perseverance. It's not about being perfect. It's about being willing to fight for what you have, even when it's hard, even when it feels like the world is falling apart. I'll never know the full story, and that's okay. Some things are too personal, too painful to be shared in detail. But what I do know is that my mom is a remarkable woman, and my dad, despite his flaws, was willing to do the work to make things right. They showed me that love is complicated and that sometimes the greatest acts of love aren't the grand gestures, but the quiet, difficult decisions to stay, to forgive, and to keep going, even when it would be easier to walk away. Story 10. Marriage is full of unexpected surprises, and one of the quirkiest and honestly most baffling things I've had to learn about my wife is how I'm apparently responsible for her dreams. And I don't mean her hopes and aspirations. I'm talking about those vivid, often ridiculous dreams she has in the middle of the night. The ones where somehow I end up being the villain, and she's mad at me for days afterward. The first time it happened, I was fast asleep, dead to the world, when I felt a sharp poke in my side. It was 3 a.m., pitch black, and I was still half dreaming myself, so it took a second to realize what was happening. My wife was wide awake, sitting up in bed, glaring at me like I'd just committed some terrible crime. You wouldn't let me have the flipping window seat, she said her voice full of indignation. I blinked, trying to figure out if I was still dreaming. What are you talking about? In my dream, she explained, we were on a plane and I asked if we could switch seats so I could have the window, but you refused. You just sat there, all smug, not caring that I wanted to look out the window. Do you know how frustrating that was? Now keep in mind that we weren't on a plane. We hadn't been on a plane in months. But here she was, fully upset with me over something that had only happened in her mind while she was asleep. I tried to laugh it off, thinking she'd realize how ridiculous it was. But it was just a dream, right? I didn't actually do that, she huffed and rolled over, clearly not ready to let it go. Yeah, but you were so stubborn in the dream. It felt real. I didn't think much of it after that, assuming it would blow over by morning. But the next day, and even the day after that, I could tell something was still bothering. Whenever I mentioned anything about flying or travel, she'd give me this look, a mix of annoyance and lingering frustration. It took a solid week before she finally let it go, and I could tell she'd mentally forgiven me for my imaginary misdeeds. You'd think this was a one-off, right? Just a weird quirk of that particular dream? But no, this kind of thing has happened more than a few times. There was the time she dreamed I ate the last of her favorite dessert without sharing. The time I supposedly invited a bunch of strangers over to our house without asking her first. And even the time I forgot her birthday. Each time, she'd wake up genuinely annoyed and I'd spend the next few days in the doghouse for something that never actually happened. I've come to realize that in her dream world, I'm apparently the source of all sorts of frustration and betrayal. And no matter how many times I remind her that it's just a dream, that I'm not actually that guy, it doesn't seem to make much difference. She knows it's irrational. She knows it's not real. But that doesn't stop the feelings from carrying over into our waking life. At first, it was frustrating. I'd find myself defending actions I never took, 
trying to argue with dream logic, which is as futile as it sounds. But over time, I've learned to just go with it. Now, when she wakes me up to tell me about some new dream transgression, I just apologize immediately. I'm sorry, honey. I was a jerk in your- I'll try to be better. It's become a bit of a running joke between us, and I've started to take it less seriously. We laugh about it later, how I'm apparently this awful guy in her dreams, while in reality, I'm just trying to figure out what on earth I did wrong. And honestly, it's one of those quirks that makes our relationship unique. Sure, it's a little weird, but it's also kind of endearing. In a strange way, it's brought us closer. These dream-induced arguments have led to some pretty funny conversations, and they've become one of those odd little things that we share. I've even started teasing her about it. When we're on a plane, I'll offer her the window seat with a big grin, just in case. Or if we're down to the last piece of dessert, I'll make a big show of asking if she wants it, reminding her that I'm not the guy from her dream. Story 11. When my husband and I moved into our first house together, I thought it would be a chance for us to really settle in and create a space that felt like home. You know, the kind of place where everything has its spot, where you know exactly where to find what you need, and where you can establish some order in the chaos of moving in. But little did I know, my husband had other plans. Plans that involved driving me just a little bit crazy in the most playful way possible. It started out innocently enough. We were unpacking boxes, trying to figure out where everything should go. I'd put the dishes in one cabinet, the glasses in another, and the pantry items in the obvious spot. Everything was starting to come together and I was feeling pretty good about how our new place was shaping up. Then one day, I opened a cabinet looking for a coffee mug, and instead, I found a frying pan. Confused, I thought maybe I'd just misplaced it during the move. So I put the pan back where it belonged, grabbed my coffee mug, and didn't think much of it. But then it happened again, and again. At first, I genuinely thought I was losing my mind. Why were things constantly in the wrong place? I'd find a spatula in the bathroom drawer, a roll of toilet paper in the pantry, or a shoe in the coat closet. Each time, I'd let out an exasperated, seriously, and start the process of moving everything back to where it was supposed to be. It wasn't until I found a jar of peanut butter in the linen closet that it finally clicked. My husband was messing with me, deliberately putting things in the wrong place just to get a reaction. And when I confronted him, he couldn't stop laughing. He admitted that he'd been doing it on purpose, getting a kick out of my frustrated yelps every time I discovered something out of place. I couldn't help but laugh, too. It was such a ridiculous, harmless prank and yet it had been driving me up the wall for weeks. He was so proud of himself, grinning like a kid who'd just pulled off the perfect joke. And honestly, I had to give him credit. It was pretty clever. He knew exactly how to push my buttons, but in a way that was more endearing than annoying. This little game of his became a regular thing. He'd find new and creative ways to hide things in the wrong spots, just waiting for me to stumble across them. And every time, without fail, I'd shout, Seriously? while he'd try to stifle his laughter from the other room. It's become one of those inside jokes that only we find funny. A running gag that's now part of the fabric of our daily life. The best part is that even though it drives me nuts, I can't help but find it amusing. It's a reminder that our relationship isn't just about the serious stuff. It's also about having fun, being playful, and keeping each other on our toes. He knows how to make me laugh, even when I'm rolling my eyes in exasperation, and that's something I truly love about him. Of course, there are times when I'm genuinely trying to find something and it takes me longer than it should because he's reorganized the house in his own special way. But at the end of the day, it's a small price to pay for the joy we get out of this silly little game. It keeps things light, reminds us not to take ourselves too seriously, and gives us something to laugh about even on the toughest days. Story 12. When we first started dating, I thought I had hit the jackpot. My husband seemed like the perfect guy. Kind, funny, attentive, and most importantly, neat. His place was always tidy, his clothes were always put away, and I never saw so much as a dirty dish lying around. I figured he was just one of those naturally organized people who had their life together, and I couldn't have been more impressed. Little did I know that this was all just part of his best behavior act during our dating phase. Fast forward to after the wedding, when we moved in together, and dear God, it was like living with a completely different person. It turns out my husband is a slob, an absolute unrepentant slob. The first few weeks were a real eye-opener. Suddenly there were clothes everywhere, on the floor, on the bed, draped over chairs. His hats, which I didn't even realize he owned so many of, seemed to multiply overnight, popping up in every corner of the house. And paper? Don't even get me started on the paper. Bills, receipts, random notes, all scattered across every flat surface in our home like confetti. One of the most baffling habits he has is his complete inability to put dirty clothes in the hamper. No, instead he throws them next to the hamper like he's trying to get as close as possible without actually making it. 
I can't tell you how many times I've walked into our bedroom to find a pile of clothes sitting just inches away from where they're supposed to go. It's like he's allergic to making that final effort. But what really drives me up the wall is his habit of leaving dirty dishes on the kitchen island instead of taking the extra five steps to put them in the sink. Every time I walk into the kitchen and see a plate or cup just sitting there, I let out an exasperated sigh, thinking, Seriously? The sink is right there! It's as if he thinks the dishes will magically transport themselves the rest of the way. And don't even get me started on the pileup when I'm not around to clean up behind him. It's like living with a teenager who's never had to do chores. And then there's his tendency to lose things. I've lost count of how many pairs of sunglasses he's gone through. At $200 a pop, no less, it got to the point where I had to put my foot down and declare a ban on buying any more expensive sunglasses. I mean, at this rate, I'd rather he just wore the cheap gas station ones that he can lose without it costing us a small fortune. But it doesn't stop there. He loses everything, his wallet, his keys, his phone. It's like a constant game of hide-and-seek, except it's not fun because it usually ends with him frantically searching and me trying to stay patient. I can't even tell you how many times I've heard, Honey, have you seen my... Followed by a sheepish request for help, finding whatever it is this time. The worst was when he lost his Apple Watch after only having it for three months. I still don't know how he managed that one. The cherry on top was the time he lost $300 in cash between work and home. He swears up and down that he had it in the car and didn't stop anywhere on the way back. But when he got home, the money was just gone, vanished into thin air. We tore the house apart looking for it, but no luck. To this day, it's a mystery where that money went, and it drives me crazy to think about it. It's become something of a running joke in our house. If I had a dollar for every time he lost something or left a mess for me to clean up, I could buy myself a brand new car, cash. I've even joked that we should start a lost and found box in the house just for him so that all his misplaced items have a designated spot. But here's the thing. As much as it drives me nuts, I've learned to live with it. I've had to, really, because after 20 years, it's clear that this is just who he is. And honestly, it's not all bad. He's got a good heart. He loves me. And he makes me laugh. Sometimes, even when he's driving me crazy, I've had to accept that not everyone is as neat and organized as I am. And that's okay. We balance each other out in a lot of ways. And even though I'm the one constantly cleaning up and keeping track of things, he brings a lot of joy and laughter into my life.